Hello everyone, Jonathan Alexander here with the Los Angeles Review of Books, and I am really excited today to be talking with Zaina Arafat, who is the author of this year's You Exist Too Much. Oh, I always get that wrong whenever I have a background. <laughs> Let's see if I can get it, get it right. Zaina, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I've got a copy of your book here, I promise. <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay, there we go. All right. I know, those virtual backdrops always make things seem like they're holograms. I know, as, as long as we've been on Zoom this year, one would think that, you know, we would have mastered everything. But thank you again for, for, for joining us. This is a wonderful book. And um, as, I, as I told you before we started the recording, I actually got the recommendation to read this from Andrea Lawler. Um, and uh, Andrea was absolutely right. I, I absolutely loved the book. And I really am, am impressed with how you manage so much content. I mean, for a book that's in part about, well, sex addiction, love addiction, complicated relationship between a Palestinian American woman and her mother, but also ultimately about political conflict. Uh, there's so much happening in this book. What, what's its origin story? What, wh where did the book come from for you? Sure. So I, it began with wanting to create a character who was um, a LGBTQ Palestinian American woman who had a um, habit of setting her sights on unattainable women. Yeah. And I wanted to explore why it is that she, someone would do that, right? And when I mentioned, you know, the fact that she's LGBTQ and Palestinian American, it was because I have never myself or rarely have I seen queer Arab characters portrayed in literature. And myself as a LGBTQ Palestinian American, I felt it was really important to see that reflected. So it started with creating this character and this habit of setting her sights on unattainable women and exploring, you know, what were the real motivations behind her behavior? What was it that she was afraid of? What was it that she really wanted? And in exploring her um, sort of search for the unattainable, I began to think about that on a cultural level as well. Uh, she's you know, bicultural, she exists in between the US and the Middle East and really can't, wants very much to attain fully both of these cultures, but it's a sort of on the outside of each. So it started to seem as though unattainability was a pattern in her life. And that helped to sort of shed light on why it was that she was steeped in this world of fantasy when it came to love and constantly falling in unrequited love, right? Uh, and then I also sort of explored how her own internalized shame and internalized homophobia were uh, part of the motivation for her behavioral patterns as well. Um, and a lot of that homophobia and shame kind of came from, you know, her cultural background as a Palestinian, as a Muslim woman. Um, but a lot of it also just came from herself and her own sort of inability to accept herself. It's wonderful and eloquently said. What I love about the book is that it, it walks that line beautifully between um, the character grappling with what, what she understands at times as a, as a pathology, but, but you know, I, I think you treat it extremely, extremely well. It's, it's never fully just dismissed as pathology. This is how she's grappling with love, with trying to love, with trying to be, to be true to, to what she desires and, and meet other people authentically. And yet the, the subtle ways in which a larger cultural and even political sensibility weave themselves in the book and especially at the end I, I, I try not to give too many spoiler alerts uh, but but the really for me amongst the most powerful scenes was one at the end in which she is trying to get back into uh, Israel and is stopped uh, at the border between Israel and Jordan and there's a protracted scene in which she is basically har harassed by a, a, a female Israeli guard. And it's a, it is a stunning scene in all of its intimacy, in all of its um, just brutality, intimate brutality in a way that pulls together so many of the scenes of the book. It's a great, great just hinge point for thinking about how we are never fully 
isolated internally or in our relations with others from political situations. Absolutely. And her political reality as a Palestinian was a large part of the sort of macro level unattainability of this book where, you know, Palestinians, um, they can't, they've been striving to attain statehood, self-determination, right? Like global recognition and, um, and validation, right? And so all of those sort of shape her shape her psyche as well. I was really interested in, in exploring how collective cultural history and trauma um, manifest in an individual. And that comes through particularly in the character of the mother and for all of the relationships that the narrative, the sort of the character has, I th think it's the relationship with the mother, which is the most intimate and the most fraught all at the same time. Oh yeah, so the mother is, you know, a very, larger than life uh, figure in the novel. She's charming, she's terrifying. She is, you know, the narrator. Again, when it comes to, you know, unattainability, the mother, the, the narrator very, very much wants to attain the mother's love and the mother is withholding and also sees her mother because her mother is an immigrant and the narrator is first generation. And so the, the mother represents for this narrator you know, access to the Middle East. She is, for this narrator, the Middle East, the world that this narrator very much wants to belong to, but feels very much outside of or on the fringes of. And so trying to sort of attain that vis-a-vis -vis her mother is part of what motivates her behavior and part of her struggle and part of her, you know, trauma, really. Yeah, yeah. And very touching when she begins to realize the extent to which um, her mother is a character deserving of, of sympathy in a lot of regards, um, really powerful. Yeah, that was her journey as well, was to go from a place of like anger and hurt to a place of empathy and compassion when it came to, you know, the way she regards her mother. Yeah, I, I love the queer representation. You, you talked about identifying with the LGBT community, wanting to, write, wanting to write a book about LGBT concerns or issues or identities. In, in a context of, of uh, kind of a bicultural family, uh, particularly a kind of an Arab uh, American family too. Uh, the character just does not really question her own, um, I don't want to label her, bisexuality, uh, but this is really one of the, the few wonderful portraits of a character who could, uh, as we would put it back in the day, you know, be readily recognized as, as bisexual, who, who really herself feels very comfortable. Uh, and, and this is kind of an interesting, interesting nexus point with, with the pathology around sex addiction or love addiction. You know, for all of that pathologizing discourse, she feels very comfortable in, in, in pursuing both men and women and being pursued by men and women. And, and I think that that's a great, that's a great gift to, to give your readers. Yeah, absolutely. It was never like, she sort of seamlessly um, can move between men and women. And I, I think what I did want to do was, um, you know, I rarely also see true portraits of bisexuality. And, and I think uh, that in this case, she is classically bisexual in the way, in, you know, her, which sort of stems, or at least for me, um, was interesting because she's also bicultural, you know, she's sort of in between in other ways as well. And I wanted to sort of, one of my main goals was to show how you don't have to make these sort of choices, all these binary, abide by binaries, culturally, sexually, and that it's possible to just be both, to, you know, like both, to have access to both worlds culturally, have access to both men and women, right? And so, um, and yeah, so that's just something that I was thinking about throughout the novel throughout writing the novel and of course like also thinking about her as just like one person who happens to be bisexual and not in any way you know like representative of all you know of course of all bisexuals I and mean, how can one person represent a community so um so yeah she is unique in her bisexuality but it's also a very sort of in my mind yeah like accepted part of her identity. Absolutely. And, and I think one of the things that's been great to see in contemporary LGBTQ writing is how 
uh, writers such as yourself, but I'm also thinking of people like Brian Washington or Brandon Taylor or, or even Andrea Lawler, uh, their self, kind of moving beyond um, coming out stories. This is this is not a character who's going to grapple with the, oh, you know, what, what am I really? How do I identify? But instead, really moving very maturely uh, and, and in a very sophisticated way into dealing with the complexities of living, living sexually, living, living authentically one's desires. Um, that's that I think is again a great, great way to sort of see this shift and development and really the evolution of contemporary queer writing. Do, do you identify with that statement? Absolutely. I mean, it's funny because I never think of this as a coming out novel. No. No, no, no. At all. Um, and it's, it, I think of it as a person precisely trying to live authentically, trying to kind of grapple with what it means to make choices and bear responsibility for those choices. Also a person who certainly has like some destructive behavioral patterns, uh, but also exploring the origins of those that go beyond just like being closeted or something. I mean, right. in this case kind of comes a lot. Like I'm thinking about how collective, you know, a cultural, one's cultural heritage impacts one day to, one's day-to-day -day self and one's sort of like cultural and kind of political heritage as well, which is why there's so many sort of flashbacks woven throughout the present day text is to really explore how those moments in one's past or even in one's collective past influence one's behavior today. Absolutely. There, there's some beautiful writing specifically around uh, also describing the, the, the sexual scene. And uh, I, I frankly found the, the relationship with Matthias sort of gripping. I mean, just absolutely gripping. It's like, what is she going to do now? Well, we'll let the readers kind of in, enjoy that on their own. But I, I, I also appreciated the, the, the poignance of um, how what was perhaps so compelling about that relationship was the sort of sexual satisfaction that she was deriving from it, but then also how maybe that wasn't the thing ultimately that was gonna be the most important for her um, in trying to figure out what she needed out of a relationship. And when she does find that better relationship, you pull back from describing the sexual dimension of that relationship. It's it's really beautiful, uh, and and I think invites the readers to pause and to think about what it what is the role of sex in intimacy. Exactly right, and I was I was just really interested in what she interprets as love and how she maybe equates that in ways with sex, or just at least you know how sex can color one's love experience in a way that maybe. Um, is a, like over, sort of in some way, um, maybe takes over mm -hmm. and, and, and to a point that, you know, when you have a sort of, not quieter love, but um, well, I'll just say a quieter love, you may, mis you may mistake it for not love just because of the fact that there isn't that like overpowering sexual sex behind it. Or the, so I was trying to like, I was thinking a lot about that. Yeah. Um, and just also the way that Matthias is, um, can mirror her and sort of brings out a lot of her, um, kind of, he mirrors her and he also is destructive to her at the same time. And that was important for me to have, for her to have that experience in the novel with, um, yeah. a lot of Another dimension of the of, of the novel that, that is really intriguing is, and I'm and I'm very attuned to sort of how different discourses shape our perception of ourselves and, and of each other, uh, and there is there are extended scenes um, in a sort of recovery facility, you know, where she sort of checks herself into this facility to help her overcome some of her, some of her addictions, but. For all of the, the psycho psychologizing discourses and even pathologizing discourses that circulate, I never get the sense that she internalizes those, which is which is great. Um, you know, a, a a a far lesser novelist would have would, uh, her work might have been overcome by 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 those discourses, but you yeah. you and your character remain in control of them. Right. I mean, I think that she has a real skepticism throughout towards those discourses, yeah. and. Um, you know, 
what I, I mean, I myself am interested in the degree to which those discourses and the sort of like path um, for, you know, quote unquote treatment, how those uh, actually, how the effectiveness of those and just the sort of like value of those. And, um, you know, I'm still sort of exploring that, but I think that when it comes to, you know, her, she is ske healthily skeptical. And, you know, while she is also impacted by the discourse to an extent, it isn't necessarily in the way that leads to a, you know, awakening or a full sort of like recovery, right? Um, there are other sort of unexpected consequences, I think, of that discourse yeah. and of those like scenes that occur in like treatment centers. Um, for foremost among them is just, she's such an alienated person. You know, she's a DJ, which is a really lonely career. She's you know, belongs to, belongs fully neither to American culture nor to Middle Eastern culture. She's, you know, sort of doesn't have an LGBTQ community and in this sort of facility, in this place, as ridiculous as she finds it, she does form community. Um, and I think that's really important for her. It's lovely. So do you have a recommendation for us since Andrea was so kind to uh, and, and insightful and brilliant in bringing this book to my attention, do you have a, a recommendation for us? Who's writing about sex right now or writing about love, intimacy, queerness that yeah. we should be reading? I mean, I, um, I'm, so I have recently, only recently, and you know, I wish I had discovered her work sooner, have been reading Melissa Phoebos' work. Mm -hmm. um, and she has an amazing collection that explores like, you know, a lot of themes around love and sex and desire and, um, you know, healthy love and, you know, versus like tormented love, uh, which is called Abandon Me. And now she has another, and she has had books in between that as well, but her next collection, Girlhood, is coming out in 2021. And I am, you know, I'm just a real, I'm a fan of the way that she really investigates mm. um, love and sex, particularly um, locating it in queer narratives, which is for me just really refreshing and exciting. So, yeah. I love it. Thank you so much. I've been talking to Zaina Arafat, whose book, You Exist Too Much, came out earlier this year from uh, Catapult. Thank you, Zaina. Thank you so much for having me.